I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for tonight. She's a well-known voice in the world of osteopathic medical education. Um, this is Gina Moses. Um, she currently serves as the Associate Director of Recruitment and Application Services at the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, uh, which is in Maryland. Uh, prior to joining AACOM in 2006, Gina was the Assistant Director of Law and Health Professions Advising at the University of Maryland College Park. And she has served as an academic specialist at Georgetown University Medical Center, where she worked with pre-health students successfully matriculating to medical schools around the nation. And for more than 10 years, Gina was at the University of Southern California, as you may have heard earlier, um, and served as the principal pre-health academic advisor for um, baccalaureate and MD students. Uh, she's also an alumnus of USC. So we're very excited to welcome Gina here tonight to tell us a little bit more about osteopathic medicine, osteopathic education. Right. Thank you for coming, Gina. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Shoshana. It's um, truly a pleasure to be back in California. So we're going to talk a little bit about osteopathic medicine. Um, I'm going to present uh, a lot of stuff that's happening in terms of um, data, what's trending in the profession, a little bit about uh, application numbers, how is that impacting and, and, and helping to actually change the workforce um, in this country in terms of medicine. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So a little bit about ACOM. ACOM is the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. We were founded in the late 1800s and we support all of the colleges of osteopathic medicine in this nation. And uh, as Shoshana said, we're located in Chevy Chase, Maryland. If you're not too familiar with osteopathic medicine, I would submit to you that really it's a philosophical approach. It's an equivalent to um, our colleagues in the allopathic or MD world, but it's really a philosophical approach, if you will, on how osteopathic trained um, students and practitioners look at healthcare and, in, and medicine. So, it was founded in the 1800s by a gentleman named Andrew Taylor Still. Hence, our founding institution in this country is A.T. Still University, which is located in Kirksville, Missouri. Um, the interesting thing about Andrew Taylor Still was he was trained as an MD. And if you know a little bit about medicine, they were doing all kinds of things that they thought were curative and preventative. Um, Bloodletting, for example. Well, we know that's not really, really based in, in anything solid, right? So um, I always ask you guys, especially those in the audience who may have an interest in pursuing medicine and osteopathic medicine, I want you to think about this. As future physicians, the goal is to bring about wellness, right? Prevent disease, um, wholeness. And so here's Andrew Taylor still. He's trained as an MD. Um, he lost all of his children, and they were very young, to meningitis. And the doctors and the physicians um, of the time couldn't save his own children. He couldn't save his own children. So really think about that. Here you are trained as a physician, and you're not able to save and protect and bring wellness to your, your children. And they died. And I really like his quote. The object of the physician is to find health. Anyone can find disease. So think about that. We all know when we're sick, or we see sickness, or we see disease, or we see illness. But as future physicians, and for those of you that have an interest in medicine, the goal is to bring about health, right? To find health. And that's a key, key thing I want you to think about for osteopathic medicine. And so today, in the 21st century, there are four hallmarks of um, osteopathic medicine. They set the tone, they set the foundation, they are the founding principles. So number one, we recognize that the body is um, a unit, body, mind, spirit. Number two, the body is capable of self-healing, um, self, you know, and, and health is, um, is part of that, self-healing, health maintenance. So I, I always like to give the example, I, I cut my finger, it bleeds, it heals self-healing properties, right? Number three, structure and function are interrelated, okay? So I was sharing with some of you that I, I went to the Redwoods and I took a hike. If I had fallen, if I had broken my leg, my function and structure would be totally different, right? Because 
the leg's broken, how am I walking? What's the fu function and the structure interrelated? And lastly, uh, osteopathic trained physicians believe that rational treatment is based upon this very basic understanding of whole. Again, body, mind, spirit, it's the whole. So if one part of your body is injured or impacted, another area is equally. And so finding the underlying root cause, finding the whole, is what the goal is for osteopathic trained physicians. I like visuals. I think they help tell the story. So as you can see, it's all about osteopathic manual treatment, osteopathic manipulative treatment. You may hear that OMT. Um, you will also hear the, the jargon um, OMM, osteopathic um, manipulative medicine. Okay, OMM, OMT. Okay, so truly the training of future osteopathic physicians in this nation at our schools um, are cutting edge. We have cutting edge programs. Uh, we have cutting edge technology. I was just at our South Carolina campus, um, our Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine, which has a branch down in the Carolinas. State of the art, everything, everything, top to bottom. I mean, it's incredible. And so osteopathic medicine is a younger profession than our allopathic colleagues. And I would say that many of the schools rise to the challenge of what is happening in healthcare, what um, are the curriculum um, issues that are taking place, how are those incorporated, bringing it now in the, in the present, not because, oh, this is how we've always done it. We have hundreds of years, and this is how we've always done it. Osteopathic medical schools really rise to the challenge of keeping it current, really hitting that refresh button. Um, primary care, that's, a, that's an item I'll talk about a little bit later on. Primary care training is a hallmark of excellence in osteopathic medical schools. If you look at the data, osteopathic schools produce the nation's primary care physicians. Um, this is a strong foundation in which to move forward in your practice if you want to specialize, because primary care is a spectrum, cradle to grave. And it really does look at the, treating the whole patient. Okay, in terms of the medical education and the timeline, I think it's also important to be very transparent. So if you have a desire to go into osteopathic medicine or you want to have an idea of the training and the education, it's more alike than it is dissimilar from that of an MD. So four years at an undergraduate institution, four years at an osteopathic medical school, three to seven years for your, um, your internship, your residency, and if you want to specialize as an osteopathic trained um, physician, yes, you can specialize an additional one to three years out. So here's the takeaway message. For anyone who has an interest in healthcare or what it takes to become a physician in this country, whether it's DO or it's MD, it is truly, truly a lifelong commitment to your education at least 18 years out, okay? And the other thing I always like to say to the audience is this. Think about the last time you saw your physician and tell me that you want to know that your physician is current, that he's up to date on whatever it is that you go in to see him or her about. Because if you say you're not <laughs> and you want to go into medicine, wrong. <laughs> you never want to go see a doctor that doesn't keep up right, with what's trending, what's the latest, what's happening in whatever particular area of medicine. I know I would never want to go to see a physician who's not current. And there's so much information out there um, that these folks need to stay current on. So it, when we say it's a lifelong commitment to education, to learning, it truly is. Because again, none of us ever wants to go to a physician that closes the book at the end of those 11 to 18 years, right? You wouldn't fathom it, wouldn't fathom it. Everything that you need to become an osteopathic physician in this country um, is the same in terms of the requirements of what you would need to become an MD or an allopathic physician in this country. So biology, chemistry, math, physics, English, um, now we're looking at biochemistry, molecular, uh, the MCAT exam. And if you're not too familiar with the MCAT exam, it's the, that's the exam that tests so that you can go on and become 
get into a medical school, whether it's MD or DO, that exam is changing. And it's going to start reflecting some of the humanities, some of the social sciences, psychology, um, you know, s some of those other types of soft skills, if you will, or softer um, areas. Um, and so medical education is changing, and it's pushing changes into the entering pipeline for future physicians in this country. Um, your letters of recommendation, your volunteer, your clinical exposure, all of those things that you would need for an MD institution and to go on to become an MD, you need the same exact things, same exact everything in your portfolio for an osteopathic medical school in this country. <clears throat> so again, DOs truly do bring something extra, something special to medicine. What is that? It's basically this specialized training that I referred to earlier as OMM, OMT. It's gained over 200 hours, about 200 hours, over the first two years of your education at an osteopathic medical school. Um, DOs truly are experts. Their hands become diagnostic tools when they're treating their patient. Has anyone here had an osteopathic physician treat them? A few of you, wonderful, okay. So you kind of know what I'm speaking uh, about. They're going to be hands-on with you. If they practice and use OMT, um, they are going to be hands-on with you. And that's really powerful. Think about the last time you went to a physician and did he or she touch you? The power of touch is incredible. It's healing almost in and of itself. But DOs really do bring this extra training into how they treat their patients, how they're looking at their patient, looking at those, the four tenants, looking through the lens of the four tenants that I talked about earlier. And their hands become part of that. Um, if you have good eye-hand coordination, if you were an athlete, um, if you were a kinesiology exercise science major, this might be a really good fit. It might resonate with you um, if it is something that you have a desire to go into. Um, and a lot of uh, DOs actually will tell you that they were a student athlete or, you know, they were involved in something and a DO treated them and it just inspired them. And, and this is something that they can offer and bring to their patients. Um, and again, like I said, I like the visuals. So it's about understanding the whole interconnectivity of the human body. If I had a shoulder injury, a DO isn't gonna just look and treat my shoulder. He's gonna recognize or she's gonna recognize the head, the neck, the arm, hand, fingers the back, it's all interconnected. And if they use their hands and they manipulate my muscular structure, they might determine, oh, I have a rib that's you know, out of alignment. And if they put that rib back into alignment, it takes the pressure off the nerve that was projected to the shoulder. And that's the beauty of osteopathic medicine. An MD is not trained like that. That's not in their training. So they'll refer you to see a physical therapist. Maybe they'll give you um, a prescription for pain med, muscle relaxant, um, you know, get you an MRI, give you a steroid shot. You know, they're gonna refer you. A DO hands-on is gonna be able to treat that to determine what is that underlying root cause, what's going on there. And that's with that additional 200 hours over the first two years. And really, that's what makes osteopathic medicine really um, special in this country. And it's really resonating with the public because of the Affordable Care Act and the focus on prevention. How do we take care of the public at the front end, not waiting till they're all sick, they're in an ER room and they're being triaged? So DOs really do rise to this, to this occasion. Um, I sometimes get the question, well, DOs, it sounds really awesome, I wanna do it, uh, can I practice internationally? I have a desire to do something internationally, yes. Right now, DOs that are trained in this country um, have either full or partial practice rights in over 60 countries, and it's growing around the globe. Um, I refer you to some resources that are, that are really great. The American Osteopathic Association, the AOA, 
the Canadian Osteopathic Association, DO Care International, and the Osteopathic International Alliance. These are wonderful resources um, if you do have a desire and you want to be able to do things overseas. You can certainly practice um, under the umbrella of World Health Organization if they're sponsoring you, Doctors Without Borders, but there is a distinction between you being trained as a US physician wanting to hang a private shingle in a foreign country versus you doing a mission under the umbrella of Doctors Without Borders or WHO. And I, I would just want to clarify that and make sure that that's clear. Okay. A little bit about the academics and um, right now in this country we have 30 colleges of osteopathic medicine, four branch campuses. The majority of osteopathic medical schools in this nation are private. That means your state um, citizenship does not come into play uh, for admissibility to our schools. Six are state schools like the UC system. We have six that are public that are tied to um, the state and to the citizens of those states. There is talk of additional colleges being developed in this country. Um, ACOM does not really have a role in the development of new schools, but we um, do understand that there's potential um, for a couple of schools in the 2016 cycle that's coming up in May when we launch. So a little bit also academically, um, right now the academic profile based on the undergraduate profile, 3634, um, overall GPA of a 3.5 is the B plus average for um, our applicants to our schools, and the average MCAT is about a 27, 28. Okay. The college information book, I did bring some, there, there are some up at the front. This is a wonderful resource. It gives you a little bit of everything that you need to know right at your fingertips about all the colleges of osteopathic medicine in this, school, in this country, um, what they're looking for. If you're interested in a DO-PhD program, for example, or a DO-MPH, which is a really nice um, fit, um, you can find out information about that. What the schools are looking for, what their mission statements are all about, um, what are their goals? What are their objectives? How do they align maybe with your interest if it's something that you're interested in? In terms of applicant data and trends, this is really exciting. <laughs> um, right now, over 25% of first year medical school students in this nation are attending an osteopathic medical school. Uh, this is pretty, pretty phenomenal. I'm gonna show you some more data. Um, by the year 2019, perhaps sooner, every one in four medical school students in this country will be attending, we anticipate, by 2019. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening in this country in terms of medicine and healthcare. Um, applications. Okay, so we um, at ACOM also are the organization that offer the ACOMIS application, which is the one central application service for all of our member schools with the exception of our Texas school, because Texas belongs to the Texas Dental Application um, Service. 2014 cycle was absolutely record-breaking for us. It was historic in many ways. We saw that we had nearly 160,000 applications made on behalf of just over 18,000 unique applicants in this country. Um, our application cycle doesn't end until the 1st of April every year. So does anyone want to take a random guess about what is happening right now in the 2015 cycle? Anybody want to throw out a number? what you think our application numbers might look like right now? No one? Okay. How much? 130,000. 130? Shoshana, you're almost there. We are at nearly 190,000 applications, and we broke over 20,000 unique applicants. So what is that saying? Osteopathic medicine truly has come into its own. More and more pre-medical students in this country that aspire to go into medicine are saying osteopathic medicine, those four tenants, treating the patient in a whole, holistic manner, it's really resonating. Society is changing, right? We all want to know that our physician is 
literally, if you will, hands-on for us, right? That they're going to physically be involved with us um, and not just sit there and write us a script, right? The generation has changed. Um, a lot of external influencers in this country are really coming um, and pushing into health care. So the government, the Affordable Care Act, um, you know, it's, it's all changing. So much is changing, and it's changing every single day. Um, the MCAT exam is a great example. That entrance exam to go to medical school in this country, that's changed because of what external influencers. The education of physicians in this country has changed. And so it needs to be reflective now in the entering exam, the entrance exam. That's changed. So everything you see is changing. Um, students are changing. Their perception is changing. The patients, the general public's perception of what healthcare is, should be. Uh, it's all changing. Um, and so this, this application data is remarkable. And, and I speak having been a former pre-health advisor, and when I was an advisor, osteopathic medicine was not the first choice. But guess what? That all changed around 2006 in this country. And since 2007, every single year, the numbers are going up, up, up. And I think, again, it's a reflection of the public. It's a reflection of the students in this country. It's a reflection of what we want. How do we want to be taken care of? Who do we want to take care of us? Um, and so, yeah, it's absolutely phenomenal. And um, now it's more about I want to apply to medical school and I want to apply osteopathic medicine. And then at the end of that spectrum, it's like I know I have options and I want to pursue my options and that's okay, but osteopathic medicine won't be number two choice because there's too many people who say I want to be an osteopathic physician. That's what I want. That's who I want to be. Um, and that's what I want, how I want to be taken care of. Um, so <clears throat> when we look at some more of the data, um, the applicant versus and the matriculant, it's really important to look at the numbers. And so if you look at 2014 data, you'll see it up here on the slide here, um, you want to look at how many first year class seats are there in this country for osteopathic medical schools. And you can do the same thing for um, allopathic medical schools as well. So for 2014, <clears throat> we had just over 6,562 seats, um, but we had nearly 18,000 folks who wanted to be in those 6,562 seats. So competition has also grown. Um, so that's also a reflection, again, about what's happening in the greater, the greater universe, if you will. And in terms of um, baccalaureate majors, um, who are these folks that are going on to osteopathic medical schools in this country? The majority right now are still biological science majors because that still meets the pre-med prerequisite. So for us, biology was the number one major. The age uh, for the entering class was 21 to 25. And that's of, of note because um, it reflects that if you graduate from college in this country, it's OK to take a gap year. Uh, it's OK to teach for America, to do Peace Corps, um, to do clinical trials coordinator positions, um, to do whatever it is that you want to do that's relevant to health care. Because our medical schools really value that experience. Because now you have something even more so to offer to your patients, to greater society, right? And so 21 to 25 reflects that, yes, our schools are interested in those students that have those backgrounds, um, that have taken the time to really think it through that this is what they want to do. And so um, you will definitely see and feel a distinct difference with osteopathic physicians in this country <clears throat> when you go and have an appointment and visit them. Um, in terms of the matriculant map, I think this is also very interesting. Um, California is number one. California is the number one state in this country, and it continues to remain 
the number one state in this country for pre-med students in this country, and it exports pre-med students in this country. And the reason is there's not enough first year medical school seats in the state of California. So think about it, you've got the UCs, you've got a couple of privates, right? MDs, and then you've got two DO schools in this country to DO schools on the, on the West Coast in California, Western University in Pomona in Southern Cal, and Toro University here in Vallejo, just outside of San Francisco. But there's not enough seats in the state of California for all the pre-meds, so they're gonna be exported. And I mean that in a nice way, clearly. I mean that in a nice way. So 754 Californians went to a DO school in this country. That's the number one <clears throat> um, matriculant um, number for us. And then the East Coast is very strong, certainly New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, Florida and the Southeast is very strong for us. If we look a little bit more to the Midwest, um, let's see, Illinois is strong, Indiana. Um, and then down in the Southwest, Texas certainly, uh, Arizona. Um, the rest of the western part of the country is, are smaller, but I think that also reflects the numbers of the population also. But um, again, it's, it's incredible. When I was doing pre-med advising at USC, California was still the number one state, and all of these years later, it's still the number one state for producing um, pre-meds and future physicians in this country. So top 20 undergraduate feeder schools, um, you will see uh, UC Berkeley should be in there. Yeah, UC Berkeley is in our top, is uh, one of our top 20 feeder institutions along with some of the other UCs. Um, you can also see that we have Rutgers in there, BYU out in Utah, Michigan State, Penn State, um, and, it, and it just kind of goes on. This is also reflecting the academics and the interest from some really select institutions in this country and the future physicians that go on. Uh, in terms of your graduate medical education, um, the nice thing about osteopathic medicine is that it does not limit you to the primary care specialties in this country. If you decide that you wanna go into anesthesiology, emergency medicine, plastics, um, you know, surgery, you can do that. Osteopathic medicine does not preclude you from any of those areas. Um, but historically, we are very, very strong in the primary care specialties. So I think sometimes there's a myth that, oh, if you become an osteopathic trained physician, you're only, your pathway is in the primary care areas of specialty medicines. No, it's all of them. You can be a specialist, it does not matter. Um, a couple of resources I want to share with you. We recently revamped ACOM's website. It's really interactive, and I hope you all get a chance to take a look at it. Certainly take a look at the ACOM reports um, section. There's a lot of really great data that we put out there. Um, and then also look at our recruiting events. Those are opportunities for you to visit an osteopathic medical school, visit it at an open house, meet the faculty, meet the current medical school students, get a sense of who these folks are and how they're contributing to healthcare in this country. Um, some additional resources geared to pre-meds or prospective students. Um, <clears throat> a brief guide to osteopathic medicine, pre-SOMA chapters. Um, if you are currently at an institution and you have an idea about wanting to do leadership, these are wonderful opportunities to start a pre-SOMA chapter. The DO Online Magazine is another wonderful resource. Um, it gives you everything that's trending, good, bad, ugly, in our profession. But this is a really useful um, resource for those of you who want to gain more information and insight into what is happening in our profession. We're also on Facebook, so please engage with us. Um, join the conversation. There's a lot of exciting things that are happening. And then lastly, I'm gonna close on primary care physician shortage. The AAMC just came out um, and it was, it made news. Um, I don't, I'm assuming you all saw the article. Um, they were talking, Dr. Daryl Kirsch from the AAMC was talking about the primary care physician shortage. Um, <clears throat> it was really interesting that it was coming from him because 
allopathic schools in this country, if you look at the data, really have a high percentage of specialists in this country. They now understand there is, in fact, a primary care physician shortage, and they and their medical schools are really looking at how are they going to help contribute to producing more primary care docs. Um, and that's a good thing. The federal government is putting money towards it. Um, there's a lot of loan forgiveness if you decide to go into a primary care specialty area of medicine in this country. So it, it's a good time. Um, there's challenges, certainly, but it's a really good time to, to be a part of this. And then um, many of our schools will rank in the top 10, top 20 of US News and World Report because of the excellence of their clinical training, their training in the primary care specialty areas of medicine. Um, and so again, it's another, um, another great resource for you to look into as you're looking at your um, school choices, but also maybe where your physician has um, been educated and trained. And so I'm going to close and just say thank you. We'll open it up for any questions, thoughts, or comments that you might have. Um, I know I hit you with a lot of information, but there's a lot of things that are going on right now, including, I'm sure you've all heard, the single uh, graduate medical education pathway for residencies. That is huge now. That's historic. MD students and DO students will now be able to do residencies. It's a single pathway. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's something that I I felt very strongly when I heard the news that it always should have been the case. Um, as it stands right now, DO students have the ability to go into MD residencies as well as <laughs> DO residencies. But MD trained students don't have the ability to come into DO residencies because they lack that critical 200 hours of the OMT piece. And so there was a recognition between the MD world and the DO world that, you know, again, outside influencers federal government, you know, funding for residencies, um, that residency slots are, are kind of, they're not expanding in this country. Um, that's a huge, that's a huge problem. Um, and with new MD and D schools developing in this country. So how are you going to get a residency? If you don't do a residency, you can't become a, a physician in this country, whether you're DO or MD, it doesn't matter. So the recognition is they needed to come together. There needs to be a single pathway. Both groups can now go into the single pathway. Um, and it's phenomenal. It's historic. And it's a recognition that at the end of the day, they're medical school students. They're future physicians. And it's just a, an alphabet at the end of their name. And one has a little bit more training in terms of the muscular skeletal system. And they're physicians at the end of the day. So I hope that helps. Um, but again, thank you all. It's, it's wonderful to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. Do you know any of the specifics about uh, the 200 hour, the extra 200 hours of training that goes on in DO schools? And is there, is it, do DO students just have extra work then? Or is there like a shuffle around where it balances out and they're not necessarily more busy? or? Um, well, if, if you ask a medical school student, they're going to say they're overwhelmed and it's a lot and they're constantly feeling like it's like that fire hose analogy of getting all that information from fire hoses coming at you. And you will hear that from MD and DO students alike. Um, my understanding from talking with students and talking with admissions folks, um, it's integrated, it's seamless, so it's literally part of the curricular structure at osteopathic schools. Um, everything feels overwhelming to a medical school student, <clears throat> everything, um, <clears throat> but it is, it's all balanced in. And so what they're learning in class, and then they have a class on, um, it's called osteopathic principles, um, and that so it's all kind of incorporated. And then they have, uh, at all of our schools, you'll see these beautiful um, settings. And they have the OMT table. And students work on each other. So they're learning about the anatomy, the physiology. And then it's all incorporated into that class that they're taking. And then they're working on each other. Um, and so it's, it's pretty well integrated and pretty seamless. And so it's not really clinical, there's no clinical aspect to it until third well, and fourth. It I mean, is clinical, and it's within the first two years. 
But it's within fellow students and you're not working with patients? Um, students are engaged in clinical settings. It just depends on each of our schools and, and how that looks at each of the schools. But there are clinical opportunities to interact with patients, yeah. Well, for the th third and fourth year, but not first and second? Yeah, or? first and second oh, okay. too, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. DO schools sometimes have um, public, um, I want to say like public health facilities, healthcare, and, and they, they treat the greater community where the school sits. Um, so again, like I said earlier, osteopathic medical schools really have a strong foundation and a strong history of clinical orientation, um, generally in underserved rural areas of this country. So look at where our schools are, are located, um, look at their mission statements, um, and then it all will kind of, you know, the pieces will all fit. But yeah, they do have outreach um, in the clinics and they do engage with, with folks from the community under the supervision of licensed <laughs> physicians, certainly. Yeah. Just kind of a follow up to that question. Mm -hmm. I was curious, so that 200 hour, hour OMT training, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the curriculum comparison between the MDDO, is that the only difference is that the DO Pretty has much. the additional 200 mm -hmm. hours. There's nothing taken out or nope. any other differences in the curriculum? Nope. And the reason I say that to you is because um, DO students have the option of, well, they have to take the complex exam, but they can also take USMLE. So with that said, that tells you right there, well, yeah, it's, it's the same. It's that you, you have at osteopathic schools, remember I go back to the four tenants, and those four tenants play out from the OMT piece, but everything else is identical. And you know, the schools can have block, block schedules, they can do problem-based learning. Um, it just really depends on the school and what their mission and what their programs are that they have. Can you talk a little bit more about the step exam so they can choose to take either US MLE or a different exam? Complex. Is, is that depending on what type of residency? No. no. So right now all osteopathic students have to take Complex and they have different steps just like US MLE, you know, steps one, two, three, we have same thing. Um, the Complex, what the Complex is, it's similar to USMLE, but remember, I'm gonna go back to the tenants, the four tenants. So how would you triage or how would you look at a patient and, and you would use the principles of osteopathic medicine on how you would treat a patient? So again, the questions are gonna be similar, but it's through the lens of osteopathic medicine, treating the whole. DO students have to, uh, can take either test, is what you're saying, mm -hmm. either board exam, not both? Or no, they have to take Complex. If they're a DO student, they have to take Complex. They can take USMLE or they don't have to. It's their decision. It's totally the student's decision. In order to graduate from a DO school, they all have to take the Complex. Complex. Okay, got it. And that eventually could change and that could look different with the single GME pathway. Okay. Right. Um, and as for um, osteopathic manipulative medicine, is there data showing um, how often do primary care practitioners use it this day, today and how effective it is on patients um, they today? Pro they, they most likely do. I know that there's a lot more research going on in terms of the efficacy of OMT. Um, you can take a look at the journal. I want to say the Journal of Osteopathic um, Medicine. Um, they have those types of articles in there. Um, and then I would look at the AOA. I would refer to the AOA's website on that. And the schools. And also look at the schools um, websites. Um, I know our Texas school has a major center for research. Um, Ohio has some really amazing research going on. 
um, the Auburn campus tied to our Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine. That's going to be a major research center. So there's a lot of it going on, but it's at the schools. Um, and that's where you would want to look to see what's been published and what's current. The DO Online also is another great resource because they just did some studies recently that were published. Yeah. Hi. Uh, for a student who is interested in osteopathic manipulation mm -hmm. um, but wouldn't plan on using it in their residency and, and future jobs such as psychiatry, um, do, I don't know, do residencies look down upon, uh, like, a, like in psychiatry for instance, do re would that residency look down upon um, a DO uh, degree and then also when you're applying to DO schools is expressing interest in something like psychiatry where you would not use OMM, OMT? You'd actually be surprised, and this is where I wish I had one of my one of the medical school students with me. Um, you'd actually be surprised at how DOs and DO students incorporate OMT in areas where you think they wouldn't be incorporated. Um, I do know that in psychiatry, there are uses of OMT. I, off the top of my head, it's not coming to me, but I have heard and, and worked with students um, and physicians that will incorporate some aspects of OMT on their patients. Um, anxiety, you know, things like that. Um, you know, trigger points on the body to help maybe relax them if they're agitated or, you know, things like that. But you'd be really surprised. Same thing with surgeon, surgeons. Um, DOs that are trained in surgery um, can use OMT for pain management for pre and post operative pain ma management. Um, Oh my gosh, uh, OBGYN physicians who take care of women that are having babies, um, lower back pain, swelling in the, the legs, um, you know, uh, the ankles. Uh, there's so many incredible uses for OMT. Um, my DO has treated me for TMJ. Well, sometimes you hear, you read on the internet or whatever resources you go to that uh, MDs, the world is their oyster, and once you graduate, you can get into any residency versus DOs. You have to kind of fight uphill to get there. Can mm -hmm. you maybe expand on that, how that's changing, how that's getting better, how it's still the same? Yeah. Like if I wanted to go into a specialty, not primary care, but maybe pathology or, yeah, yeah. or surgical, I mean, are, are there going to be as many options as an MD is going to have, or is it going to yeah. be... What, what am I facing? So, okay, so I kind of was kind of trying to address it in, in this young lady's question earlier. Um, once you're in medical school, it's sort of like the reset button happens again, right? So your academics, the letters that you need to have, like you're gonna get a dean's letter, um, how well you do in your performance, um, in your internships, your residencies, um, all of that now is gonna matter. Guess what? All of that, your complex scores, it's all gonna matter. And that's gonna make the impact for how well you eventually will match to your residency. So if you think that you want to start out one way, by the time you're in your third year and you start having all these experiences, it may be something very different that you choose to go into ultimately. But that track record of all your grades, how you performed, how you got, a, how well you got along with your faculty, your classmates, I mean, all of that stuff matters. It goes into the dean's letter. And this isn't anything that's unique to DO schools. It's the same thing for MD schools. <laughs> I mean, it's all the same.